The Labour Party is very good at being out of power. For 90 of the 120 years of its existence, it has lingered in opposition. It is, by extension, very good at picking leaders. Well, all right! Who lose. This last 10 years has been some of the worst. Thank you, and goodbye. Yet the result has been the same, if not worse. In nearly every direction, nearly every compass point, it is hollowed. Our exit poll is suggesting that there will be a Conservative majority. I'm just sorry that we've let people down. It has fallen to Keir Rodney Starmer, Labour's 19th leader, who wants to be only its seventh Prime Minister. His is a party still wrestling with its recent past in a country it seems no longer to understand. Yet in many ways, we know so little about Starmer, the man who would be Prime Minister. I think he's grounded. I do think, think he's got a moral centre, that he's uh, obviously highly intelligent and, and believes in a set of values. He is very loyally. Um, he's a bit, I mean, and a bit, and a bit boring in, in how he operates. He will become one of the greats. I am, that I'm absolutely convinced of. But this inscrutable and even prim figure is in fact a gambler. He has made big gambles since becoming leader, each a contested assessment of his political situation and where the country's future politics will come to be. Keir Starmer, in some ways, ran as the heir to Jeremy Corbyn. His first gamble, internally anyway, has been to lead as if he were almost anything but. His campaign to become leader of the party was pretty, pretty good. The, the, the fact that he put a wonderful um, video together, seeing how left-wing he actually was, the fact that he had represented the miners. Anybody who didn't know who Keir Starmer was would think that we've got somebody here who's probably as, as left-wing and a, more devoted to socialism than what Jeremy Corbyn was. But of course, that was never the case. When victory was secured quickly, nearly all of the major Corbynites were removed from the shadow cabinet. Elements of the left cried betrayal. Yeah, I don't think you could put people in a shadow cabinet based on their politics. You have to put them there based on ability. And that's what Keir has done. Corbynites in the old shadow cabinet didn't have ability? Um, I wasn't making those decisions, but there's nobody in the shadow cabinet now who I wouldn't have wanted to see in there. This has all been met with little resistance so far, but the left hasn't been extinguished, far from it. In the Parliamentary Labour Party in particular, it's stronger than it's been for decades. The left has to regroup. Um, but the left is still very, very vibrant and will play a key role. That's why I've said to Keir that his, his argument about wanting a united party, he's right about that, but he shouldn't forget his left wing and I'm going to be his friendly conscience along the way. Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! And there are old wounds still festering too. Some who, far from seeing Starmer as the answer, blame him for the party's abject defeat. Our options must include campaigning for a public vote, and nobody is ruling out Remain as an option. Of course, Keir was one of the main, if not the main, uh, protagonists for uh, moving towards a second referendum. He did everything in his power, uh, politically, to make sure that we move towards uh, second referendum. They had strong beliefs, uh, but frankly, they shouldn't have been able uh, or allowed to express those beliefs from the shadow cabinets. Uh, they should have expressed those beliefs from the back bench. Exiting the EU. You can't underestimate either the anger felt still on part of the left about Starmer's role in the party's Brexit psychodrama. You've got to remember that. Keir had a project of his own to come lead the Labour Party. I blame his mother for calling him Keir. And I wasn't going to work with him to forward that project. You were suspicious of him? Yeah. Because you were cognizant aware of his ambition? Well, his family's ambition is, is fairly apparent. And I think it's noticeable 
having been Mr. Remain all the way up till he got the leadership of the party, you don't hear much from Keir about Remain now. Well, I've got to say, it is fairly ironic to hear the, you know, under new leadership, uh, get Brexit done. You know, it brings tears to my eyes. Just tears? Or a bit of anger as well? Both. Probably tears of anger. The intra-Labour battle has certainly been quietened by Covid's grip on our politics, but it hasn't gone away. And some expect that it will reignite once again when the EHRC report into institutional anti-Semitism in the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn is finally delivered. It is widely expected to be damning and some expect Starmer to act on its conclusions and mark a decisive break with what's come before. Obviously though, if there are individuals you know, who are named in, in such a report, the leader and the National Executive Committee would have no alternative but to take action uh, against them. This debate, as so often surrounding anti-Semitism and Labour, is one about language. But when McCluskey sat down with me, he used language that could be considered an anti-Semitic trope. Does it give you any pause at all that I conducted an interview with Peter Mandelson yesterday where he was nothing but full of praise for Keir Starmer? Not whatever, Pete. I stopped listening to what Peter Mandelson said many, many years ago. I would suggest that Peter just goes into a room and counts his gold, not worry about what's happening in the Labour Party. Leave that to those of us that are interested in ordinary working people. Peter Mandelson had a Jewish grandfather. Mr McCluskey maintains that the language he used is not anti-Semitic. Starmer's is a wily politics. Unsurprising then, when asked his favourite Labour leader, he answered with the wiliest of all, Harold Wilson. Mr Wilson, are you overawed at the prospect of being Prime Minister of Great Britain? In many ways, I suppose, the sheer physical task is easier than that of being leader of the opposition. In that wiliness, there is something a little Wilsonian about Starmer. But the thing Wilson had in spades, an easy appeal in the party's old heartlands, is what some fear Starmer does not. It explains his vault fast on what used to be the biggest issue of our lifetimes, his biggest call. We have to accept the fact Brexit is gone. What it we're still in a really bad place in the sense of the, the deal that Johnson's trying to push forward isn't what he promised, it's not what he signed unfortunately for him, but Keir gets that it's done, we can't change that, it's all down to Boris Johnson now and we have to win back red wall seats and to do that we have to accept it's gone, we need to get these seats back because they're working class seats, they're, working, they're our people and we need to be there for them another of Starmer's gambles, that these seats can be won back. In other words, that a centre-left party can stop the bleeding between the working class and the left that we've seen across the West in recent years. That you're able to do so by escaping the culture wars, simply not playing that game and crafting a more traditional politics around competence versus incompetence. He is the ultimate anti-populist. In other words, he's making a bet that this country is neither culturally nor as politically divided as Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson thinks we are. There's nothing to gain from driving wedges between people. It wouldn't make sense politically to do that, but also it's just not the right thing to do. And the whole essence of the Labour Party, and actually I think of Kia really, is about bringing people together to find what we have in common and to forge a future together as a country rather than a divide and rule strategy, which, as I say, is the wrong thing to do and, and, is, and is wrong politically as well. And that's why Kia is not getting drawn into these so-called culture um, uh, wars, because Kia's whole approach is about bringing people together rather than driving wedges. And isn't the risk from that that, A, it has actually been very successful around the world in terms of people who do want to drive wedges. Some people say you can't take a water pistol to a knife fight. Well, the approach of the last four elections hasn't succeeded. Many in the party disagree that this approach misunderstands the politics of now. I think a return to the politics of managerialism. It's saying um, we can manage the current system better than the Tories. We can do what they're doing in a more effective way. He's still a socialist. 
but he is a realist and he knows that we have to appeal to all sections of the British population in order to be able to form a government. So he's pragmatic in that sense. But it's a gamble which is bigger still. It assumes that in doing all you can to reinvigorate support among the older, more socially conservative Labour heartland voters, that you don't lose what was gained in the Corbyn years, a politics of dominance among the young and the wider liberal left. It is a gamble, therefore, which assumes that those people have nowhere else to go. Yeah, well, I've heard that before. New Labour used to say that about white working class voters actually, they've got nowhere else to go, so they could do what they wanted. I don't believe in this uh, narrative about culture wars. It's really a euphemism. I wanted to talk about race and feminism and LGBT rights, and you can't um, sidestep issues like racial justice. You just can't. Do you think Starmer has tried to do that? I would like to think that he hasn't tried to do that, because as I say, it's impossible. How do you think he performed, for example, over the Black Lives Matter protests and George Floyd and the uh, toppling of the statue of Edward Colston and so on? There was the Black Lives Matter protests, which he called a moment. There's no question that some people thought he got, at the very least, his tone on those issues wrong. Well, there are many decisions ahead. The biggest gamble is perhaps yet to be made in policy. His allies tell us that his approach will be new. At the last election, no one had ever heard the word coronavirus. We are now in a totally different world to where we were before. So the 2024 manifesto will be addressing and tackling the challenges of the 2020s and the 2030s, not of 2019. Will it be radical? Will it be inspiring? Absolutely it will be. There is an obvious but imperfect analogy for what Starmer is trying to do. A traditional figure with a pitch to restore the dignity of political institutions, of politics itself, to make politics boring again, of putting the politics of the last decade to bed. I think that the election of Biden will certainly help and strengthen uh, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party in Britain because they are in some respects operating on trying to travel along parallel tracks. Uh, I think he is prepared to make it absolutely clear that he's not going to be the competent face of Corbynism. That project has come and gone. It's now behind us. Keir Starmer is a paradox, a man who ran as a radical, whose greatest strength is that he is sensible, a man of caution, taking risks. He is this decade's answer to the last, a counter-revolution to the endless politics of upheaval, both within his party and without. But what if there is more upheaval to come, where Britain itself comes apart, where Boris Johnson is no longer the question to be answered? If he's not forever to be the second most famous Keir in Labour history, answers to some or all of these questions he will need. There was good old reporting. Well, following the filming of that interview, Unite has clarified the comments Mr McCluskey made about Lord Mandelson. In a statement, Unite said, Mr Mandelson's religion was not relevant to the comments made by Mr McCluskey. Indeed, to the best of our knowledge, Mr Mandelson is not Jewish. The ordinary meaning of the statement made by Mr McCluskey is one of his belief that in recent years, Mr Mandelson has had more interest in increasing his own wealth than in fighting for social justice for working class people. The suggestion of any anti-Semitic meaning to the commentary would be ludicrous.